Hello, everybody. My guest today is Emmanuel Shalit. He's the CEO of a company called Dashlane, the world's best password manager. He has over 20 years of management experience across the tech and media sectors. Before Dashlane, he was CEO of CBS Outdoor France, EVP of Universal Games, and the founder of C and CEO of Flipside.com. He began his career focused on navigation algorithms for the Mars Exploration Rover. Emmanuel, are you ready to take us to the top? I am all the way to Mars. No offense, but I think like Mars exploration is a little bit cooler than password management. Why did you decrease your cool factor and go into password management? Um, because I think at the end of the day, uh, short term, I can have more impact on mankind by focusing on this. Good, good answer. Good answer. All right. So you came on back in October uh, last year, 2017, told us a lot about the business. Give us a quick update. Uh, for those that did not hear that interview, what's the company do and what's your revenue model? How do you make money? So we are very focused on getting revenue from the right place, which is from our users. Why? Because that allows us to be very transparent about our business model and to earn their trust. We make money because they pay us for the services we provide, not because we do anything with their data. Yep. And so we are um, a few days away from uh, passing the 10 million user milestone. And um, a large portion of these users are paying subscribers. Yep. I think you told, when you were last on the show, you told me you had about 500 folks, 500,000 folks minimum paying three bucks a month minimum. And so minimum, you're doing 1.5 million a month at that point. But those were all minimum. So you could be way bigger. Um, we are bigger now. I uh, think, uh, you know, we're getting closer to... Uh, to uh, very close, actually, to two million a month. Oh, great! Um, and and continuing to grow, um, you know, our, our revenue overall uh, grew by uh, more than eighty percent last year, and could grow by even uh, higher percentage this year. Sorry, you say over eighty percent? Yes. So, I mean, if you're doing, if you're about to hit twenty four million in ARR, you're saying about a month, about a year ago in March twenty seventeen, you were caught somewhere around fourteen fifteen million. That's a reasonable assumption. Okay, great. And uh, just to be clear, you're not selling data. All that revenue is coming from a number of paying subscribers paying three bucks a month. Exclusively, whether they are individuals or whether they are companies that buy uh, the business version of our product for their employees. I see. So whether the consumer buys it or the, or the person buys it directly on their own credit card or you're selling a team plan, the average pr seat price still comes out to about three bucks. Uh, three bucks on the individual side, uh, more like four bucks on the business side. I see. So additional features. I see. So if I divide three bucks into two million in monthly revenue, you're about to hit, and what you have about six hundred fifty thousand paying customers, something like that. Uh, directionally correct. Okay. Uh, because it depends on 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 the mix between the two, but you're you're in the rough ballpark. And, and one thing that really impressed me, and Emmanuel, I want to dive deeper on this, about last time we came on the show, typically churn is through the roof on companies like this, this low ARPU, high volume, but yours, you told me, was less than 1% gross logo churn per month. Is that still accurate today, and how have you gotten it so low? No, it's actually significantly lower. What's, what's probably unique... Um, well, Emmanuel, how the hell do you go significantly lower than 1% gross logo churn per month? Well, because you look at it annually, <laughs> and if I, depending on the courts I look at, for some courts we have annual churn that is in the uh, you know zero point three, zero point four percent. So Monthly. that's how you go lower. But in reality, our net churn is actually negative. How so negative? Let me explain why, because uh, that's not coming from any upsell. That's coming from the fact that we are in a business where there is a very long tail of conversion. To give you an example, we have people today that started using Dashlane in 2013, that have used the free version for the last five years. And because of GDPR, because of Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, I say, you know what, I got to get serious about this. I'm going to get the paid version. And so we add more people uh, to our premium subscriber courts every month or every year than we lose through churn. We effectively have net negative churn. Let me ask that differently. It's a little easier to understand. Annually, what is net revenue retention? How far over 100? Uh, you could think about 105. Okay, that's pretty healthy at this kind of volume. So good, 105% annually. And have you have you made any additional tweaks? I mean, you have a huge user base, 10 million people. You know, converting 500, 600, 700,000 to paid is obviously a healthy rate. But if you can add 
or eke out an additional percentage point, it's huge for your business. Are there any tests or levers you're pulling to try and do that? Constantly, but our focus, um, and, and it's going to be more and more the case, is on engagement rather than revenue. We see revenue as a direct consequence of engagement. Another way to think about that is the ratio between, let's say, for instance, monthly active users and paying subscribers in, is one of the most stable metrics in our business. And so our focus is how can we get more engagement because we know by product of that is an increase in retention and in revenue. So, so you, because you have a huge cohort, you probably know the one or two things you've got to get a new sign up to do in the first two hours to make sure they're yes. sticky. What are one or two of those things? The, the two clearest indicator of future engagements are, uh, you know, people that have added 10 or more passwords in their app very soon. Um, and even more so people that have installed Dashlane on two devices, ah. your phone, your laptop. The moment you've done that, the likelihood that you stay for a very long time and that you end up becoming a premium subscriber is very, very high. So let's talk about the first. How do you drive and make – like what do you do on the interface or how do you drive 10 passwords added in the first you know, five hours? Well, one great example of a feature you talked about, things we released, uh, we released in Q1. Um, is a feature that's uh, aimed at mobile first users, which are today the majority. You know, today we now advertise on national TV in the US, which means a lot of people hear about us on their couch, they take their phone, they go to the app store, they download Dashlane. And what we've added is an experience where when you add, uh, when you start your journey with Dashlane, we just ask you to connect Dashlane to your inbox, to your mailbox, to your Gmail account, to your Hotmail account. And we scan that directly on your phone, purely client-based, and we identify, because of the emails you've received, all of the accounts you have. We, we can tell you which one are at risk, which ones may have been breached, and we allow you to import those accounts directly in Dashlane. That's one of the ways you drive more engagement with minimal effort from the user. Mm -hmm. Does someone actually though, have to sit on their phone and let's say you say, hey, Nathan, I've identified that you have 100 applications with passwords. You like, start verifying them on the mobile app and I click you know, fresh books and I have to manually type in my phone for each one that password or is there any way you can port them from online? So great, uh, great question. There are, there are two things we can do. The first one is that, um, and that's actually a driver we use a lot. We tell people, if you now connect the Dashlane app on your phone to your desktop, we'll be able to import all those passwords from your browser. Because no one so, wants to type in all that, right? No, that's the exactly. biggest friction point. Exactly, so that's one of the ways we drive that engagement is to tell them now you can go get these passwords because they sit in your browser and actually it's a good opportunity to remove them from that browser where they're not secure. Interesting, uh, each month, how many new users are you adding, free users total? Um, think about, um, a quarter million. Okay. Users. And, and what percentage of those are coming from mobile first versus desktop installs? Today, think about, uh, 50, 50. Okay. That's pretty healthy. And how aggressive are you being in terms of like, you know, TV promotions, direct paid spend? Well, more and more, uh, because the challenge we have to address is very simple. Today, the vast majority of individuals know about the problem, the pain points related to digital identity, but they don't even know that there are solutions. Yeah. You know, people, our biggest competition is do nothing or it's an Excel file or an Evernote note, which is a terrible ID. Um, most people don't know that there is a solution. That is why as the leader in this market, we have to invest more and more aggressively to educate consumers, to educate businesses about the fact that there is actually a solution. Mm -hmm. That makes good sense. I mean, tell me what more is, though. I mean, are you talking like you're spending a million a month, five million a month? What, how aggressive are you being on direct paid monthly? Um, today, you can think of us as spending. Uh, we are below a million a month, but that okay. number is, is quickly growing. Got it. And, yeah. North, and, of, and north, so north, of, north of 500K a month? Absolutely, yes. Okay, Significantly, good. It's closer to a million than 500K. Okay. And you've raised capital. How much have you raised? So we um, have raised two, um, two types of capital. Um, we have raised equity uh, in the past. We did three rounds of equity for a total of 54 million. Um, but we have a business now where essentially 
the the uh, uh, the use of capital is largely user acquisition, and because of the incredible retention characteristics we have, because of the high predictability of our cash flows, we are actually uh, able to fund the business with debt, which is much more attractive from a, 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 a from a cost of capital standpoint, from a dilution standpoint. So I won't go into the details, but today we have. Uh, the ability to raise significant amounts of debt to accelerate our growth because yeah. that capital mostly goes towards user acquisition and we have very short payback times. Yeah, how short? Uh, significantly less than a year. Okay, got it. L- less than six months or no? Uh, it depends on the months. I see. I see. Okay, so you'll you'll let it fluctuate, but it's right now it's currently less than twelve months, and you you won't go above twelve months ever in any cohort. No, we, we, we're trying to stay below 12 because then, you know, that uh, increases our ability to be uh, capital efficient. That's right. Talking about capital efficiency, if you spend a million a month on direct paid stuff and you're adding a quarter of a million folks, right, in terms of free users, that's about $4 per free user. And you mentioned earlier, you have about almost 10 million users. You've converted 600, 700 grand, 700,000 of them into paid. So 7% conversion rate, it means you need what? Was that you need about 13 leads to get one new paid customer over some period of time. So can I multiply that $4 for a free lead times the 13 to kind of back into your CAC? You can, but um, you're uh, ignoring, uh, and, and, and you don't have a choice, but, but you're ignoring what I said about this very long tail of conversion. Like if you take it into account, uh, in reality, it, uh, it ends up being lower. Interesting. Yeah. So what is CAC today? Are we talking like 30 bucks, 20 bucks? For a paid customer, yeah. um, I no, I, I, I won't get into that. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Well, well I, I can do this. Worst case, it's $52 yes. based off what the numbers you just gave. But what you're saying is there's other things I don't know about. It's actually a little less. Well, it's significantly less than that. Yes, and there are synergies between the B2B side of our business and the B2C side of our business, yep. which means that whenever we generate individual users, they end up working somewhere and that somewhere they tell that company to. And, and so the, 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 the value of those relationships and this engagement we're creating is actually much higher than just thinking about the CAC and the, the first year. Yep. And, and again, when you have very, very high retention, uh, when you are, you know, in the low single-digit annual churn, those lifetime values are extremely long. In fact, we don't know where they end, and so you know, you are creating a, a, a true asset. Yep. I want to dive more into kind of the land and expand kind of synergy you just articulated. I think a good place to start is on team. So last time you were on seven months ago, you had about 130 folks on the team. What are you at today? Um, all in, I think it's closer because uh, that that 130 includes. Um, both employees and people that are working exclusively for dash lane on functions like user support, QA that are, that, are, that are not employees, but that are effectively members of our team. If I include all of that today, um, I think we are uh, north. We've grown by about 25, but our growth is now accelerating because we've, uh, we, we've raised a, a new, uh, new capital. And so, um, you know, that all in number, could be uh, pretty close to uh, 180 uh, to 200 by the end of the year. And how many of them are sales folks or onboarding? Our um, the bulk of our business is actually happening in a self serve way, whether it's consumer or uh, whether it's with small businesses. We have. Uh, small focused sales team that deals with bigger accounts. How, how many though? That's what I'm curious about. It, it's it's really small today. It's like two it's, people, two two A's and one CSM. Got it. Yeah, that because that's what you get into the land and expand, right? You you see two hundred fifty thousand new logos starting using you every day, and if you see it at Uber dot com sign up, you're going to put one of your inside sales reps on there because you know that you could expand it to three thousand seats pretty quick. That's certainly one way to approach it. I think we're also trying to push more and more the fact that um, employees are going to do that work for us by pushing more and more collaborative features so that actually at some point it's uh, that company calling us saying, wow, I now have, you know, a third of my staff using Dashlane. I want to get that uh, in a more, you know, centralized fashion with more control. Can I get, and I want to pay for it 
um, in you know one subscription rather than having 30 people expensing it. Yep. Debt is getting actually more and more popular for a variety of reasons. Walk me through the kind of model you decided to go with. Did you go with the traditional kind of interest rate approach over kind of a four-year period or did you do something that's a percentage of monthly revenue and that's what it's the paybacks tied to? No, uh, and and here I can't go into details, but let's say that um, um, in our case, we were able to negotiate really attractive terms because of the nature of our cash flow and that uh, none of what we have agreed to is is uh, tied in a hard way to you know revenues or covenants or anything it's really uh, we were i think our business was sufficiently attractive that we didn't have to yep to, to get there did and and can you you obviously did some research on debt options before you decide to you know do the deal with whoever you did the deal with what are some options like actual names some names you know SaaS capital lighter capitals out there silicon valley bank scale works there's a recurring capital there's a lot of kind of debt financing companies are there any that you th- you should you want people to make sure they take a look at if they think about this no i i, I don't think i i uh, i've done enough uh detailed research myself. I talked to the top firms we were engaging with. Um, one of them we, we we retained, the other ones we didn't. But Can I you think, name a few of the top ones though? Don't say who you worked with, but name a few that you, you talked to. No, I'm, I'm not sure at this stage, but I, but I can give you another perspective, which is that I think uh, one thing I heard from many of these firms is that when you get to later stage rounds, you are often constrained by things like minimum check size, uh, which then force you to either accept a lot of dilution or a very high valuation that may turn against you if the markets go in the other direction. In our case, we needed capital, but we didn't need an extremely high amount. And I felt it was bad for the company to take more than we needed. That's why debt was very attractive. There's no notion of minimum check size. There's very little, if any, dilution, and there is no forcing mechanism on the valuation that ends up being artificial and turning against you. Yep. Now, you, you need to have the unit economics to attract that debt, but today we're fortunate that we do. Yep. Uh, look, you're approaching 24 million bucks in ARR. You've raised 55 million in equity. You have some debt on top of that. I mean, when are you going to go sell this thing for you know 500 million bucks and go start figuring out how to go to Mars? Um, well, given the cost of going to Mars, my target is closer to two billion than five hundred million. <laughs> so I need a bit more time. But look, we we right now we see our business accelerating um, more than we anticipated. We see macro trends around what happened with GDPR, what's ha- happened with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, uh, you know, furthering that acceleration. We have no uh, interest in, in selling. Of course, if somebody knocks on our door with an offer, we will look at it very seriously, especially if it's an offer that can help us accelerate our growth. But we are very, very focused on the acceleration of our business right now because we are carried by macro trends that are extremely favorable. So would you and LastPass ever merge? Well, LastPass was sold to a company who logged me in two years ago now. Yeah, sorry, um, I said differently. Would you? Would you? Would you? Is that a good home for you? If LogMeIn came to you so you could essentially merge with LastPass, would that be interesting or no? I'm not necessarily sure because I don't think our strategies are as aligned. Um, LogMeIn is fundamentally focused on the B2B market, which is not a bad thing in and of itself. But we approach digital identity with a different length, which is it's not B2B, it's not B2C, it's B2H, business to human. We are focused on the end user, whether he's at home and at work, and the let's say the the approach to the individual, the mass market approach we have, is probably not at its best home in a company that is purely focused on B two B. Of course, yeah. No, go ahead. No, no, that's 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 all. Okay, good. On that note, Emmanuel, let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? The last one was uh, Where is Everybody, which is a book about why the Fermi paradox uh, hasn't been resolved. Why have not we found aliens? It doesn't sound like a business book, but if you read about it the right way, it is. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying? Uh, The guy who is going to put a million people on Mars, Elon Musk. Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building a business? 
uh, it's got to be Atlassian suite of tools. I mean, our business is effectively built on it. Number four, how many hours of sleep do you every night? I'm trying to be religious about seven and religious about always going to bed at the same hour, even on weekends. That's, and what hour is that? Um, it's going to bed at 10 and waking up at five every day of the week and the year. That's pretty good. And what's your situation? Married, single, you have kiddos? Married, two kids, an eight and a half year old boy and a one and a half year old daughter. Oh, great. Congratulations, young ones. And how old are you? I am 54, not for very long, though. <laughs> okay, that's good. Well, happy early birthday, Emmanuel. Last question. What do you wish your 20-year-old self knew? Nothing more than I knew because then where, the, where would the fun be? <laughs> Guys, there you have it. He wishes he knew nothing more than what he already knew. He's really enjoying the journey, having a lot of fun, likes thinking about Mars, decided to go do something more practical in the short term. We're going to have a bigger impact, and that is passwords and password management, really you know, the macro trend of cybersecurity in general. 2012, the company was launched. They've now passed, or they're about to hit 10 million total users. on. They're adding out 250,000 new users to the platform every single month, about 50-50, installing mobile first versus desktop. They've converted a significant portion of those caught between 5 and 8% to actual paying customers about to cross $2 million in monthly recurring revenue or $24 million bucks in ARR, 105% net revenue retention annually, again, with their team of about 180 people based all around the country. Super healthy payback period to less than 12 months. Emmanuel, thank you for taking us to the top. Thank you.